It is now my pleasure to introduce um, Dr. April Reside. She's a postdoc in the NESP Threatened Species Hub. Um, she was also uh, nominated uh, by the ESA for the John Maddox Prize this year. This is a prize promoting sound science despite adversity in doing so. Uh, April's been a, a real inspiration, I think, to a lot of ecologists around the country uh, in, in, the, um, in her advocacy. She's made the black-throated finch, the black-throated finch. She's made it a household name. Um, I think uh, it's, it's won the uh, Bird of the Year Award. Uh, um, April, uh, although admitting that she does feel a bit nervous this morning, she does seem to draw energy uh, from attempts to bully her into silence. Uh, and, and so we, need, um, we need people who will stand firm uh, in the face of, of the oppression that we're uh, experiencing at the moment. So today she's going to talk about the, um, the EPBC review, and that's all I'll say. April, please come out. Woo! Thanks very much. Do I have a... Is this my machine to click? Is that it? Big green for go forwards. Uh -huh. And this exploding picture here to, for that laser point. OK, can I go back? Oh, great. OK, thank you. Should have practised beforehand, shouldn't I? OK, thank you so much for the invitation to come here and let me spread the word about the finch. That is my mission in life at the moment. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners in which I live and work and um, pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. I have four things that I'd like to speak to you all about today. And the first one is that Australia isn't doing very well at preventing species and biodiversity decline. Our current laws are not safeguarding our species. Right now, we have the chance to change the law, make it better, and that ecologists play a crucial role in making sure our environmental law is going to be fit for purpose. So I'm going to start with the first premise of my talk. But it's important to look at Australia's biodiversity decline in the bigger picture of global decline, which isn't overly rosy. And I don't mean to just be really depressing. Well, you know, it's a bit of a side effect. But I think it's really important that we really get the full context of what's going on here. And so the latest International Panel for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services report found that 75% of the Earth's land surface is significantly altered. Over 85% of the wetland area has been lost globally, and over a quarter of the assessed species are threatened with extinction. And unfortunately, Australia is one of the worst performers. So we've lost 90 species to extinction. That's uh, 36 plants, a bunch of mammals and birds, frogs, at least one invertebrate, probably more. We don't tend to be very good at keeping track of how many vertebrates we've got or used to have. And we've lost three vertebrates in the last decade. And this is the thing that I think isn't as well uh, recognised, is that the extinctions aren't just some historical thing that happened 100 years ago. They're happening right now. And in fact, the rate of extinction across Australia hasn't really changed that much. It's a fairly steady rate of extinction. And so this is not a situation that's getting better. And Australia just isn't investing to the level that is required. And so we've actually seen a very substantial reduction in the amount of money that the Commonwealth Government are spending on the environment, even since 2013. And the projections are it's around 65% decline of uh, federal investment into the environment since then. And it's a really small proportion of our GDP compared to the global um, OECD countries. We have so many endemic species, so we should be spending more than most OECD countries, but we're spending less, which is disproportionately bad because we've got so much. And a recent study showed that we're, we're probably spending around 15% of what we'd actually need to recover species. Okay, so that's... You know, that's the background that we're operating within. And our law is not safeguarding our species. 
I'm going to talk primarily today about the Commonwealth Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, which um, came into force in, probably in the year 2000. And I I'll, might touch on some Queensland laws, but focus on the Commonwealth law. And now I get to introduce my finch, the black throat finch. Isn't it awesome? It's such a pretty little bird. It's so such an innocuous little bird. Like, it's so harmless. Look at it. It's, it's this little cute, fat little bird. But, you know, if you were reading The Australian, you'd probably think that this one bird has derailed this massive coal mine, that this one bird is risking all these jobs. It's going to derail $16.5 billion mines. And uh, it's a really strange space to work in because it doesn't seem to matter how many peer-reviewed scientific papers you publish. If you want to talk about your little bird that just happens to share some habitat with a coal deposit, all of a sudden you're an anti-coal campaigner. I mean, <laughs> I've got probably a few things to say about Greenfield Thermal Coal Mines in 2019, but I try not to talk about that because I'm actually, my expertise is about the finch and that's what I talk about, that's what I publish on. But uh, I think one of the greatest weapons that the press has to try and demonise the people that they think aren't on the same page is to just discredit, you're just a campaigner. Why the big deal about my cute little finch? I like to call it my finch, sorry, that's a bad habit. Okay, so the black-throated finch used to occur from north of Townsville all the way uh, south to northern New South Wales. I'm scared I'm going to press the right, wrong button. There you, that button. Okay, so it used to occur across quite a bit of Queensland down into northern New South Wales. Uh, and so the year 2000 is the year that the EPBC Act came into force. And since then, it's been in a much restricted range. So you can see the post-2000 range is already a lot more restricted. We've tried to reconstruct where we think their habitat would have been. Uh, and we think based on the historic mapping that they probably had about that much habitat before Europeans arrived in Australia. In the year 2000, we think it was probably about this much. Still a fair amount of Queensland would have been black throat finch habitat. A lot had been lost before then, but we still had a fair chunk. And from the mapping now of the habitat types in which they exist, we think they've got about this much habitat. And we've calculated that it's approximately an 80, a bit over 80% reduction in full extent. And I'm using lots of qualifying language maybe we think we've reconstructed. And that's because uh, black-throated finch habitat is a bit of a dynamic entity. So they need to eat grass seeds every day and they need to drink water every day like other granivores. And so if there's no grass seeding at that time, then that habitat isn't suitable at that point in time. And so things like uh, grazing, cattle grazing and drought, when those two things interact, or maybe just one or the other if they're particularly bad, might mean that there's no grass seeds at any one point in time and that habitat's not suitable. And so what we probably need is all of that habitat to persist in good condition because some of it will be the drought refuge, some of it will be that bit that keeps those seeds in the really driest, driest times. Some might be the wet season refuge, like there are some places where as soon as the rain hits, all the seeds germinate, there's nothing for them to eat. So they actually need quite a lot of habitat to be able to track where their food exists. And so uh, when I say that we think this is where they are, you might go to a beautiful patch of the right kind of woodland and they're not there. Does that mean they're never there or it just means it wasn't there when we happened to go? Anyway, that's how much habitat we think they've got. So the black throat finch was listed as vulnerable under the EPBC Act when it first came in. And that was the same year that, Australia, uh, that Queensland got its Vegetation Management Act and it also coincided with quite a bit of land clearing in Queensland. Then it was uplisted by 2005 as endangered under the EPBC Act. And then as part of that process, it ended up getting a recovery team, a group of people who in theory are interested in trying to get this little bird back to its full extent and it got a recovery plan written for it. So 
It's doing moderately well in terms of the amount of attention that it's got. It's recognised as endangered nationally and in and Queensland state legislation. It's recognised as extinct in New South Wales. Um, so it has a team, a plan, all these things, but no funding for its implementation. So that's a fairly, the no funding thing is a fairly common situation with a lot of species. But there are a lot of threatened species out there that don't have a recovery plan or a recovery team, and they're probably being threatened by the same things that the black throated finch might be threatened by, but there's just fewer people advocating for those species and speaking out about what's going on. And despite the black throated finch having all of these things, its habitat is still being cleared. Now I'm just going to pause for a moment to give you just a little rundown on the EPBC Act and how it is supposed to work. So if I'm a developer and I want to go and I want to build a road or a coal mine or a housing development or something, then I have to consider the question, will this action or development have a significant impact on a matter of national environmental significance? And those words that are underlined all have very specific definitions under the Act. The matters of national environmental significance could be the listed threatened species, threatened ecological communities, Ramsar wetlands, migratory species, a few important things that we need to protect. And there are guidelines to uh, demonstrate what would be a significant impact. And so all of these things are fairly well defined. Will my action have a significant impact on one of these matters of national environmental significance? No, then I don't need to go and ask the Commonwealth for permission for my action, I can just go ahead. Maybe, yes, then in theory I'm supposed to go through this full referral process. So I'm supposed to apply to the federal government for permission to go ahead with my action. And so there's an initial screening and then the question is, is it then posed, is it likely to have these significant impacts? No, approval from the Commonwealth not required, off you go. Yes, then controlled action. So the controlled action would require detailed assessment and then a Commonwealth approval to proceed. And then finally, we get the final decision, was it approved, approved with this conditions or not approved. So that's the process. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about this referral stage to begin with. Now, in a quite a sensible fit of uh, transparency, the federal government have made all of the referrals available online. So you can jump onto the EPBC website and just go through every referral that ever existed since the year 2000. You can go and have a look and look at all of the approval documents. Um, so it's, it's a useful resource for us to then try and examine what's going on. You can also just download these referrals as a spatial database. <clears throat> so I did. This is just all of the terrestrial referrals in Queensland since the Act began. So in about the year 2000, that's just where they are in space. So one of the questions I wanted to ask was, well, how many of these referrals since the year 2000 would have intersected with black throated finch habitat since where black throated finches would have been in the year 2000? And the reason I was curious about this was because I sit on the black throated finch recovery team, we've just been seeing these proposals to keep clear black throated finch habitat just sort of flooding in. There's been a bunch of new housing developments, the Bruce Highway upgrade, new sugarcane developments, three solar farms, you know, a bunch of coal mines, and it just seemed just really overwhelming. That, I'm just describing 2017 here. I'm just thinking, is this, am I imagining it, or is there a lot of development going on in black throated finch habitat? So I intersected the map I showed you earlier of black throated finch habitat and this spatial database of the referrals. I was amazed to discover 775 referrals to interact, clear black throated finch habitat since the act began. The caveat here, of course, is that where black-throated finches were in the year 2000, which is where we mapped the habitat, might not have been black-throated finch habitat in 2017. So that's the caveat here. But I'd argue, if you've got an endangered species that was there 10 years ago, I still think you should check, <laughs> especially one that's hard to detect. I think it's reasonable 
to actually go through that process to make sure it's not still habitat for that species. So I'm showing here the, um, let's see, I'm showing here the, um, the decisions with, uh, with these 775 referrals. And over half of those, which are these gray bars, were not controlled actions. So that's over half of the referrals to clear black throat finch habitat didn't need any conditions to do that. They could just go ahead and clear. Less than half were designated as controlled actions. And there were three that were deemed to have a clearly unacceptable impact on black throated finch. Oh, sorry, a clearly, un clearly unacceptable impact. One of those on the grounds to black throated finch. And that was a housing development in 2008. So that was an awful lot of people wanting to clear black throated finch habitat that have asked, gone through that proper process. But then the next question was, well, is black throated finch habitat being cleared that's not going through that full referral process? And again, I was really blown away by the magnitude of that. So we estimate around 50,000 hectares of potential black throated finch habitat was cleared since the act began that didn't end up going through that full referral process. So to recap, basically, black throated finch habitat is being cleared quite rapidly with approval from the federal government going through that assessment process or without having that full, um, full assessment process. This is the bit that gets all the press. This is the bit that you may have seen in the papers um, getting the media, this little bit here. And I think it's important to draw attention to this because it's the best habitat we've got left. But it's the best habitat we've got left because we've lost all of these. <laughs> and so we've only got a little patch near Townsville and a little patch in the middle there that are in really good nick. And the reason why they're so important now is because <laughs> so much else has been lost. And if you're ever lucky enough to go out there, it is so amazing. There are black throated finch flocks out there that you will just not be able to see anywhere else on earth. It's, it's just incredible. And this was a photo taken by a PhD student, Stanley Tang, back in 2013, and he counted a flock of 400 black throated finches. Uh, and it's, it's an amazing place. And what we think one of the reasons why it's really amazing is because it's had a low history of, a uh, history of light grazing. There's uh, a plant species out there, a poison bush, Gastrolobium grandiflorum, it's poisonous to stock. And so it's probably just never had a lot of cows on there eating all the grass seeds. So it's just in really good nick. The finches are in large numbers. It's beautiful woodland. Oh yeah, not just black throat finches. A couple of other interlopers in there. And so of course that was the site of the notorious Adani's Carmichael coal mine where all those finches are found. And it has been getting a lot of attention, but there are actually five coal mines that have received approval from the state, Queensland, and federal government to clear black throated finch habitat. But it's not uh, just those five mines. I think there's about 14 mines in total that are proposed out there. And these are greenfield mines. These are mines where there aren't existing infrastructure. So it's, most of that is uh, native woodland that will be turned into big holes in the ground. And so there's um, one mine in the wings, hasn't gone through all that formal process, but it would be the, um, it would be double the size of Adani's Carmichael coal mine. So Adani gets all the press because their mine is just so big. There's another one twice the size that has been proposed. So then I guess the next logical question is, well, is it just black throat finch? I mean, is that just a really unlucky species or is this something that's happening to lots of our threatened species? We have a PhD student in our group at UQ who's done a really amazing job. I mean, I thought it was hard just doing it for one species. She basically took similar methods and replicated it for every terrestrial species, so um, over a thousand species. And she actually discovered that 85% of our listed threatened species actually had habitat that was cleared since the year 2000. And that equated to 7.7 .7 million hectares of threatened species habitat. And I'm not talking about like if one hectare here was for koala and black throated finch and yakka skink that we counted it three times. No, just each hectare was counted once to 
um, regardless of how many species we're. So it's a, it's a big area and there's a lot of species losing habitat. What was interesting to note is that when Michelle went through all of the different referrals, um, mining is really compliant. Actually, mining go through that process. They apply for their approval, they do all the documents, they basically do what the government tells them to do. And not all industries are as compliant. And actually, agriculture is the biggest driver of land clearing across Queensland. You may have known that map I showed you before. A lot of that clearing had happened in Queensland. Most of that's agriculture. And yet agriculture just aren't interacting with the Act. They're not referring their um, clearing activities. They just don't interact with the Act. So there's a couple of levels here. One, are we even getting the habitat loss to go through the process? Two, once they get to the process, are we doing anything about that clearing to prevent habitat species loss? I'll just go back here just to point out that, um, oh, no, wrong button again, that most of this loss is this red stuff, so that's without referral. So all of this loss here, in fact, the vast majority of it, I, it was over 90%, was clearing that happened without going through that referral process. So that's most of what's going out there, clearing that's not interacting with the Act. Just another little piece of evidence in case I haven't already convinced you that we're not doing so well at preventing species decline in Australia. Uh, another postdoc in our group, Jeremy Simmons, he looked at all of the species listing under the EPBC Act and he found that four times more species had been listed from vulnerable, uplisted to endangered or critically endangered than had been downlisted the opposite direction. And so that means that there's a bunch of species like black throat finch that start off as vulnerable, we keep clearing their habitat, they just keep getting more threatened and that's not an isolated case. Now, when some of this agricultural clearing that has cleared habitat for threatened species, it's happened, and then the Department of the Environment has gone, oh, I guess we should do some enforcement of our act, and they've actually written letters to landholders to say, look, we think you may have done some clearing that didn't go through the proper process, and we need to investigate this. The sitting MPs for those electorates um, in, interfered and basically said, don't you dare attack our farmers, back off. They're our farmers, don't you hassle them. And so even the meagerest attempts to try and um, hold some of the really large clearing events to, you know, the landholders to account, they weren't able to actually do any enforcement and compliance because of the political interference. So Queensland, this is all Queensland, you know, it's Queensland, but I think we need to, sorry, did I say? <laughs> Queensland's getting all the press. Northern Territory is about to be the next clearing hotspot and the amazing habitats in, in the Northern Territory. There's so much intact forest and woodland, it's wetlands, it's, it's so amazing. Uh, we need to keep an eye on this because it could be the next clearing frontier. I'd just like to take a little uh, interlude here just to say that, you know, one of the, one of the um, things that people want to do is, okay, well, what can we do about this? Maybe we can just offset. Maybe we can um, have our developments and then just offset that loss. But I just want to let you know that the way the offsets is being do done now, they are not preventing species decline. So. If we want to put offsets into this discussion, we need to be really honest about what offsets can and can't achieve and what it would take to get an offset to actually be something that would prevent biodiversity decline. There was a really nice study that I encourage you to read that did a big global review of all of the offset projects that they could find. And they found that very few offsets ever did the kind of study design where you could even tell whether the offset was preventing further decline. Uh, and they, this, these offsets were the ones that actually did the study design where you could look to see if they were preventing decline against a counterfactual. They were mostly in countries with good governance, with strong institutions. 
and they didn't find any offset in the world that managed to achieve a no net loss of species or whatever they were trying to have a no net loss of in a terrestrial ecosystem. Just, it hasn't been done, but if you look at the way these offsets are being planned, as an ecologist, you're like, yeah, well, I could have told you that. This is not planned in a way that was going to prevent this species or whatever you're trying to protect from declining. The other thing about offsets is it, can, it could be a bit of a, an easy way out. It might be telling people, well, you can have your development, we're just going to offset, off we go. And it might mean that the development and the regulator are not going through the mitigation hierarchy as thoroughly as they could. They're not assessing their options for avoiding loss, mitigating loss. They're just going straight to offset. So I just want to reiterate, if offsets are going to be part of the question, let's be really honest about what they can achieve. And that's a really important role as ecologists we can play. And so I'm going to put to you that if our objective is to retain our species and our ecosystems, that we need environmental laws that prevent habitat loss for our threatened and endangered species. And the good news is that right now, we have a chance to change the law. So the 20-year stat statutory review of the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act is happening right now. And if you jump onto the EPBC Act website, they've got lots of information about this review. I encourage you to all have a look. The reviewer is a specialist in public policy, um, in economic reform and regulation. And there's a panel, there's a traditional owner from Cape York, a geologist with 40 years experience in minerals and petroleum, policy advisor, experience in natural resource management, and an environmental law and policy expert. This is the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. Unfortunately, no one on the panel or the review, according to the website, have expertise in biodiversity and conservation. We do. That's where we can come into this process. So the review was announced in October. The discussion paper on how they're proceeding with this re review and the main questions they're asking it came online last week. And we've got until the middle of February to put submissions in for this review. When the review announced, we saw this article come out in the financial review. It's tis the season to slash green tape. Uh, it's a little bit alarming. I would have thought the opportunity, the law reform was an opportunity to make our law better. This is our federal environment minister who thinks that this law reform could be an opportunity to make things better for business. Ecologists play a really crucial role in making sure that these laws are going to prevent the decline of species and ecosystems. There's been some really amazing work by the Australian Panel of Experts in Environmental Law, Appeal, again, some really amazing information. I encourage you to read it if it interests you and some great recommendations in there. And I've been talking to some of the lawyers on this panel and I've learned a lot about law and the way that law works. But they're experts in law, not experts in ecosystems and species. And when I speak to my law friends and colleagues, they say, well, we rely on your science to know how this law is going to work or not work. So we need your science to help us inform how this law needs to be. And it's the ecologist that can inform where the perverse outcomes might be. So a perverse outcome, for example, when it, Queensland first got its Vegetation Management Act that was supposed to control clearing, clearing rates skyrocketed. So a perverse outcome is an attempt to do something for an outcome and you get the opposite outcome. And as we know, working with ecosystems, this stuff happens all the time, right? Like ecosystems are just so complex and dynamic. You know, it can be hard to predict what a new perturbation in that system is going to result in. Ecologists need to demonstrate um, with evidence, with data, with expertise, what offsets can and can't do. We need to be advising about the strengths and weaknesses of offsets. We need to be the ones advising on how environmental impact assessments um, need to be stronger, better, more rigorous. Um, we put the media release out this morning and I quoted a 
particular environmental impact assessment that was done for a sugarcane farm to bulldoze some black-throated finch habitat near Townsville, they went out to survey bats and they went out in June and they put out a couple of anabats for I think two nights in June. Now, I get, you know, Townsville's pretty warm, but it's the dry season. Like, you don't survey bats in the dry season. So, we need to make sure that these processes are rigorous. We also need ecologists that know how to do proper monitoring, like to get out there. What do we actually need to do to detect our threatened species? If we go out there and don't find the threatened species, does it mean it's not there or we just didn't detect it? An evaluation of the decisions that are being made. The ESA are doing some really amazing work, um, putting forward some good policy around strengthening the acts, implementing evidence-based development of policy and decisions informed by the best available ecological science. So um, the ESA is working on this, just in the process of trying to think how we can make the best recommendations for this review. I encourage everyone to get involved because each combination of a species and a threat and an ecological context requires specialist expertise. And so uh, at the moment, the plan is, if you're keen, and do please jump in, here's the email address, the policy at ecosoc. There'll be information on the website as soon as that we get that up, but we're still kind of generating the plan at the moment. But uh, be in touch, uh, stay tuned for what's going on. ESA will put out a submission. There'll be other groups putting out submissions. But the strength in what we can deliver for this law reform are the evidence-based narratives that are quite specific. So I'm going to be talking about black-throated finch and what this law means for black-throated finch. But for the systems that you work on, if you can see where the law might be working or not working or where it needs improvement, specific details, places, data, this is what's going to be our strength. We need to demonstrate what to do. We need to be able to show the numbers, show the outcomes, show the maps. And so I really encourage you, if that's, you've got something to contribute to this act, then please send in a submission that is relevant to what you work on and your expertise and join uh, the ESA submission as well. Um, you know, wherever you feel like you can make the contribution, I encourage you to do so. What I'm going to be recommending for Black Throated Finch, the first number one, thank you, the first number one, uh, genuine protections for habitat. We can't keep our species out there in intact ecosystems if we keep clearing them. We just, at some point, need to put hard limits on how much can be cleared. Black Throated Finch have lost 80% of their original extent maybe it's time we say, yep, I'm sorry, you can't lose any more. The second recommendation is that we need to evaluate any potential impacts in the whole context. And so that means cumulative impact assessments, not just this one development, this one development. What about all of those developments together? Because maybe every single individual development might not have a significant impact, but when you've got 775, that's a significant impact. So we need to actually look at that whole context in terms of the developments, but we also need to look at black throated finch habitat in its whole context. That actually this particular patch is the drought refuge. Yeah, maybe they're not now, it's the wet season, but they'll be there at the end of the dry. So we really need that patch. And we need this other patch over here to get them through the wet season. So like the whole species context as well. And if our objective is to prevent species from declining and we want to use offsets to meet that objective, we would need to put that offset in place, demonstrate that it's working. And by working, I mean we're going to compensate for whatever we're going to lose in that development with the equivalent gain. So I'm saying if we're going to lose a flock of 400 finches over here, we need to gain a flock of 400 finches in our offset site. I'm skeptical that we have the know-how to do that, right? <laughs> so do it, put it in place, demonstrate you can make that work, then you can build your coal mine. They've been planning these coal mines for 10 years. A lot could have happened in the last 10 years to try and develop how we improve black throat finch habitat. And uh, having read some of the plans for how they're going to manage these offset areas, 
<laughs> it's, it's really dismal. They're really not putting much thought into this. So we, we need some rigour in these offsets and plans. OK, to recap, Australia is not doing so well for preventing biodiversity decline and extinction. Our current laws right now are not preventing this decline, but we have a chance to make it better right now, and ecologists play a crucial role in that. So thank you very much. And yes, time for questions. Carla? Are you waiting for a call from the Environment Minister? <laughs> they don't like talking to me. I don't know why. Not really sure. But uh, yeah, I get more calls from um, yeah, NGOs than I do the Environment Minister. But uh, I, I'd love to chat to our Environment Minister. Uh, yeah, definitely. I'm definitely concerned about that, for sure. Yeah, you know, I'm on soft money. So many of us postdocs are on soft money. We're relying on someone to find some money year to year. So yeah, definitely, it's a concern. Um, and you know, well, black throat finches don't have any funding, so I'm not really scared of them losing any funding because they don't have any. Um, but yeah, definitely a concern. Did you mean something specific? Sounds like a conversation for morning tea, maybe. <laughs> or now. Um, thank you. Uh, the, uh, I don't know how much it's um, uh, made the news up in Queensland, but we had that incident with the farmer who um, was clearing his land and na uh, National Parks, or whatever, uh, <laughs> went, and they were, they were shot and killed. Um, and I think that's something that we need to consider and make us think about when it's not just people are clearing land without permits, they're killing people. Hey, I was curious that a lot of what you said was um, indicating that law was not being enforced. Um, and so, but you seem to be saying that the law should be changed rather than that the law should be enforced. Yeah, both. The law needs to change and it needs to be enforced. And so, um, you know, people disagree about this a lot. A lot of environmental lawyers are saying there's a lot of great content in that law. We just need to enforce it. But if it's not working, then maybe there is something missing. And at the moment, there is so much ministerial discretion. So. Uh, you can have all these great processes and then the minister d can decide that his brother-in-law's farm that was affecting the grasslands isn't a problem. So we're going to change the listing of our threatened ecological communities. Yeah, so at the moment, like, because of that discretion, the law isn't working. But there are definitely two things. The one, that the law does miss a lot of the clearing the second that when it actually does pick up some of that clearing and goes through the process, it happens anyway. So enforcement is definitely a really big part of making a bit of law and compliance, but also there's a, a lot of really great recommendations on how to do that. Some is just make it really clear at the moment, like is it gonna have a significant impact or not? And there's all these big document of guidelines. What about there's an endangered species there, I have to refer or I want to clear more than one hectare and there's an endangered species. Like, just make it really simple. Let's have a process where it's black and white. You know, here's, here's something that might not want to be, have their habitat cleared. We need to get permission. Uh, yeah, so maybe some of the changes could be subtle and it's just about making it simpler, taking away ministerial discretion. That would make it better. Um, but yeah, definitely the enforcement is a big part. I think I've got a burning question down here. The mine that was twice as big as Adani is the Alpha North mine. 
Thanks, April, for an absolutely terrific presentation. Um, I've just been wondering with the environmental law whether what we actually really need is the lobbying for environmental law, thinking that even though we have expert involvement in making laws, politicians probably only start really changing and implementing law once they know they have the voterships kind of behind them. And I've been wondering whether you've thought along those lines as well. It's really weird, I can't see you, Anka, so I've just got this disembodied voice. Oh, no, I can see you. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, definitely, we need, a, we need the political mandate, absolutely, you know. Do we get what we vote for? I guess so. So, yeah, I totally agree. We definitely need that mandate. Um, and there's a lot of work by a lot of our environmental non-government organisations, BirdLife Australia, Australian Conservation Foundation, that are doing a lot of that. And it's really sad to see this crazy polarisation with the debates. I know that happens everywhere. It does happen in North Queensland particularly, that it's economy or the environment, which is clearly a false dichotomy and it's not getting us anywhere, right? We end up with outcomes that aren't really good for either. So, yeah, how do we tell that story better that we, we all benefit from a healthy environment, we all better from a healthy economy? How do we make sure we're ticking both? So, yeah, I agree. Maybe that's our role. Maybe that's the role of NGOs. We can probably help with that. So, uh, thanks very much, April, for an absolutely wonderful talk. And uh, yeah, join me in thanking April thanks. and uh, wishing her the very best of luck. Thank you. Good on you.